Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. Today's episode is brought to you by Roofstock, the leading online marketplace for buying and selling leased single-family homes. Are you interested in adding rental real estate to your portfolio? A recent white paper called The Rate of Return on Everything examined global asset class returns all the way back to 1870 and concluded that residential real estate, not equity, has been the best long-run investment over the course of modern history. Roofstock offers quality pre-screen, single-family rental homes located in some of the best real estate markets in the country, with quality tenants already in place paying rent. And now, you can find all of this without ever leaving your own home. Roofstock is making what used to be an incredibly long and difficult researching and buying process fast and simple. That's because they do lots of the work for you by vetting properties, tenants, and property management companies so you can have all the info you need to find the right investment for you. Generating great income from rental properties has never been simpler. To learn more, visit roofstock.com forward slash meb. Again, that's roofstock.com forward slash meb. And now, on to the show. Welcome, podcast listeners. I am back from Lake Tahoe, and today we have a great show with you with one of the most prolific writers in investing. He's written for the Wall Street Journal, Barron's Forbes, Journal of Financial Planning, Human Behavior, and Psychology. Today has written nine books. Yeah, something like that. Nine nine books on investing. Many co authored with his friend, economist Ben Stein. He's also the founder of Conservative Wealth Management where he works with high net worth clients. On top of all that, he has a PhD in clinical psychology. Welcome to the show, Phil DeMuth. Fabulous to be here. I'm thrilled to be on the best of all possible podcast. So I've known Phil for a handful of years and he's a uh, localish here to LA, to the Manhattan Beach studio. So he's in studio and we catch up every once in a while. But, you know, I think for context, Phil, we like to start, get a little origin story. I want to hear how you went from the beaches of Santa Barbara to getting a PhD to now being a money manager and author. What's, what's the kind of origin stories? Well, I was a clinical psychologist for many years, and that was a lot of fun. But I found that I had just as much interest in money as I did in psychology. And I would often get sidetracked by asking patients not about their sex lives, but about their financial lives. And this became more and more interesting to me. Much more interesting. So, and at the time, I... I inherited a little bit of money when my mother passed away by a very little bit. So this immediately plunged me into the world of Morningstar.com. I learned about how to pick five-star mutual funds, and that was a great way to riches until it wasn't. And so the whole thing seemed to be much deeper and more complicated than I thought. So this was always a side interest. But then I also realized that I had a burning desire to be a writer, and that's what brought me out to Los Angeles. And I spent a few years laboring away in the vineyards of Hollywood, a terrible, terrible idea, terrible business, but it taught me great humility. So that great humility has never left me. We often, you know, like, and I have a lot of friends in that world, and it's just as competitive as like investment banking, but worse pay and much more random you know, the outcomes are, you know, there's a lot more just kind of luck and relationship based, of course, but really hard. But it's fascinating to me that in the restaurant world are kind of my two nightmares, investing in movies and investing in restaurants. But it's endlessly fascinating. And there has to be big money there else, you know, no one would do it. But, you know, as, as you were chatting with Jeff before the show started, it's a it's a fascinating world. So, all right. So you started writing. At what point did you transition to writing about investing? Well, one of my pals out here was Ben Stein, who's an economist and an actor, something of a humorist himself. 
And he and I would have lunch all the time and would obsessively discuss the stock market. This is during the dot-com boom, and we're both kind of effortlessly getting rich on a very micro scale as we watched our stocks just go up every day. It was a great life. You just check you know, Yahoo Finance every five minutes and you were richer than you were before. So it was all good until about 2000. But by the way, that that is probably a pretty timely feeling for a lot of people right now in year, what, eight, nine bull market or however you look at it, but the US stock market's been going up. All right, so just keep going. And by the way, that's one of the things that terrifies me because I do find myself looking at portfolio performance just as I was doing in 1999. And although now I'm smart enough to know that this is not necessarily real what I'm looking at. So it is, it's, it would be a great like, you know, how OK Cube at the dating site publishes all these analytics. It'd be great if we could somehow reach out Schwab, if you're listening, Fidelity, Interactive Brokers. I don't know who the most forward thinking kind of brokerage is, but say, all right, can we get a median and average number of times account is checked per day, per month across your universe? And then because I know Betterman can do it because we t- we've chatted about this, but but to be able to do it back to you know say the '90s, maybe Schwab could do it. We'll reach out, see if they come up with a stat. It'd be I, it would obviously be very coincidental, right? It would be exactly probably what we would expect. I don't know how. Anyway. Post podcast, we'll reach out, see if we can get some of those stats. But go ahead. It's a great metric, and I'm sure you're right. It's completely cyclical with the market. So Ben and I are having lunch, and then the whole stock market, you know, falls apart. It's 2000, 2003, and we're both kind of there, you know, licking our wounds. And Ben says to me, you know, this idea that you cannot time the market, you can't time the market, there's something kind of fishy about this, because... You can seem to be able to, it makes sense to be able to buy things when they're cheap and sell things when they're expensive in many, many domains in life. You know, if you're buying milk at the grocery store or gas at the gas pump, you have some sense of when gas is expensive or cheap. And yet in the stock market, the most efficient and liquid market, transparent market around, they say, oh, you can't time the market. Well, that's like saying you have no way of knowing if stocks are cheap or expensive. Well, the funny thing about that is that almost every person who admits that you can make a fundamental analysis of a business, so Lemonade Stan, also almost always agrees that you can do it for a house or a car or a stock. And almost universally, those people say you can't do it for an entire market, which has always been strange to me. Right. They say you can value the lemonade stand. I'll tell you that's expensive or no, that house in Vancouver should be worth one million instead of two. That's crazy. Or, hey, why would you ever buy this stock at 300 times earnings? You know, that all makes sense to them. But When you apply it to the stock market, it's been so, you know, just accepted for so long that I think people and it's hard. It's probably hard for a lot of reasons. But anyway, keep going. (laughs) Sorry to interrupt. So I said, well, let's look into this. So. As a psychologist, I had some graduate coursework in statistics. So I said, well, let me just get a data series and let's see if that's true. So I went to, I think it was Global Financial Data. I got their total returns data file on the S&P 500 and said, let's, let's find out if this is the case. So I took a look at like, I think it was an average 15 year moving average of things like price to earnings ratios, price to sales, price to book value, and as well as just price itself, and wanted to see if there was any way you could time the market just using these kind of simple metrics, long wave metrics. And sure enough, it seemed to make a huge difference. If you bought at periods when the market was very highly valued by all these metrics, and they all tend to cluster together anyway, your long-term investment returns were very poor. But if you bought during financial crises of one kind or another, the Great Depression, any time when the metrics were all depressed, your long-term returns were very good. So Ben said, let's write this up. This is a book. So I said, well, I don't know any publishers. And he said, well, let me see what I can do. He sends off one email and we have a book contract in 10 (laughs) minutes. (laughs) So we set to work writing this up. So suddenly I had like a little book out. uh, Yes, you can time the market, a sort of long wave financial market timing. And I thought, well, if I'm doing this and I'm investing my own money, I said to myself, it would be no work at all for me to just take on other people on the same investing journey that I'm going on. So I'll just put up a website, put up my phone number, and if anybody calls and says, Phil, we'd like you to invest money, I can do that just as easily as doing it for myself, he said. 
So then suddenly I was off and running as an investment advisor. And so fast forward, man, when, when did that book come out? 04? That was 2004, yes. Man, fast forward 10, 15 years, you have nine books, a multi-hundred million dollar investment business as a solo practitioner. And it's, Phil, you're, I'm going to give you a compliment, particularly later as we get through this interview, as, as being one of my favorite writers. Um, but so I figured we'd start with one of your more recent books. And a lot of them have similar themes, but then we can talk a little bit more about kind of timing the market ideas and everything else interspersed. But one of your more recent books, I really like, The Fluid Investor, um, came out a few years ago. Great overview of investing, talks about portfolio fundamentals, talks about psychology, which, by the way, as a side note, my brother, who did his PhD in psychology, and it took him like, I mean, like 10 or 15 years. And he was one of the reasons that I took time out from grad school and worked because he's like, Meb, take a year off before you go back to grad school because it may be a long slog. And so that unintentionally pushed me into money management because I took a year off and this would have been in 2000, 2001. And then it was too much fun. And next thing you know, forgot about biotech and became an investor anyway, but have a, have a big interest in psychology as well. So, all right. So you talk about personal finance, taxes, retirement, everything else. Give us kind of like an overview of your framework for how you approach investing. How do you think about it? That's a broad question, but what's, if someone came to you and say, Phil, what's, what's your, what's your general kind of approach and how, how you put it all together? Well, I suppose everybody says this, but I really do try to do it, is I try to really construct a portfolio that matches the person's life situation, you know, the industry they work in, their pre-existing holdings, all of that, what we call the risk tolerance, stuff like that. So I, so I, I really try to customize it. It's bespoke to a higher degree. I'm not just putting everybody in a 60-40 silo. But that said, I do have certain Lego blocks that I tend to work with. So I suppose I start with just the global market portfolio, and then I tilt that in particular directions. So I would be inclined to do long-only factor-based investing for you know small value stocks, for momentum stocks, and for low beta, low volatility stocks, and do that all, all over the world. I would titrate that with bonds to whatever extent necessary. And I would also cut in some alternatives, some gold and some liquid alternatives from companies like AQR Capital that seem to do a pretty good job in that space. So it's some mixture of those things. And then it gets customized if they're very high net worth, they're very concerned about taxes, I get into zero dividend stocks and stuff like that. But Don't, don't you worry, thing, we're going to come back to that. Great. But you know, talking about taking this from kind of theory to application, one of the nice things, like, so if I, I just ask you that description, you know, it's pretty broad, but then one of the nice things about your books is you get very, very specific on ideas and concepts, and we'll get to those in a minute. But so let's, let's talk a little bit about high net worth guy walks through your door. And by the way, one of my favorite things about your website is you have a minimum for financial planning, wealth management. But if you say, look, if you have less than this, I've posted the global market portfolio using ETFs. Go do it on your own. Have at it. It's free. And that's pretty awesome. You don't see a lot of people kind of advocating this no-cost portfolio for younger or may not even be younger, but people with, with less money. But uh, by the way... There's a company called Cambria Investments that has one that's yeah, just like well, that. Yeah, but we, we charge. I mean, well, actually, we don't on the, on the ETF. But yeah, so the global market portfolio. So say someone walks through your door, and we'll talk a little bit more about the kind of planning concepts, ideas, and how you may skew it. But in one of the ideas I also want to talk about, so your, your company's name is Conservative Wealth Management. We had on the podcast last week, a guy who was talking, he says, you know, what's interesting is in the, the company was riskalized and they have 20,000 financial advisor clients and said, in general, we found that a lot of the advisors, their own risk tolerance, you know, so some would be really conservative personally or really aggressive personally would skew what their clients ended up doing. So it ended up being a little self-selection bias. Anyway, it's less of a question, more of a comment. But but thinking about designing these portfolios, how do you kind of go about it? So you evaluate the net worth, risk appetite, drawdown threshold, return expectations. Is there kind of a template you start from or is it automatically kind of getting customized from the get-go? Well, it depends on where their human capital is centered. In other words, a person who's in financial services has a very high beta career. Their income, their whole life is going to be closely tied 
tied to the performance of global financial markets in most cases. So you want to dial back on that kind of a sector. The secret sauce, I think, is that I, I think I do it all through beta for the most part. Mm-hmm. I just look at what is the beta of this person's human capital. And then depending on what that is, for, for example, I have a, a friend who is a bankruptcy attorney and he has like 100% negative beta in his life. He can uh, invest incredibly aggressively because his human capital is thriving in the middle of the worst recession. He's just like buying a new Ferrari. And human capital is something that I think that current financial advisors do really well that a lot of the automated solutions don't do a good job of yet. You know, and thinking about being able to project careers and say this person is in a kind of future proof career is this sort of thing versus this guy who his job is going to be automated and going to be done by a robot in five years, you know, or <laughs> but thinking about human capital is something that I think financial advisors do a great job of that most of the platforms don't do a great job of yet. And that's actually a really fascinating insight that you just mentioned on that kind of negative correlation. But keep going. Didn't mean to interrupt. It could all be automated because once I enter a, if I go to a robo site and enter what I do for a living, that matches up with a federal job number description. And once we know that, we could probably infer a certain amount about, I mean, it wouldn't be as good as actually talking to somebody and finding out exactly, you know, if they work for the post office or if they're a college professor or what. But even the robo-advisors can make headway there. So I'll probably be out of business in a few years too. <laughs> okay. But it's funny because, you know, as far as temperament of investors and, you know, you list on your website the different kind of types that, you know, may work with. Are there any that you think are particularly predisposed to not, and we're just broad generalizations here, but investors who may be kind of their own worst enemy or struggle with a plan or others that actually are kind of well suited for investing? Because I have, I, have <laughs> I have my comments on this, but as far as, you know, doctors, lawyers, engineers, execs, scientists, athletes, what's any, any kind of thoughts as, as far as your experience? Right. Well, my experience is somewhat limited because my clients are self-selected. They're invariably people that have read the books or articles or heard me talk someplace. So they said, for some crazy reason, we sort of like the way this guy sounds. Let's go this way. So we already have sort of a similar temperament. And I imagine there are a lot of people out there, celebrities, athletes, that just basically want to get rich and who don't darken my door with their uh, queries. It's funny though, you know, we, I mean, and I can say this because I'm an engineer, but historically a lot of our individual clients that have been doctors and engineers have been really challenging on, and we can talk about psychology, but super brilliant, bright, but they love to tinker, the engineers do. So they're always trying to mess with the portfolio. The doctors usually have a little bit of, I have a lot of doctor friends, a little bit of hubris because they're so smart. And so there's a, there's an element of, you know, I can do better than this, you know, buy and hold or whatever it may be. We probably couldn't even get into celebrities and athletes because they, they tend to be the, the worst. But you see, doctors and engineers both should be terrific investors, if you think about it, because they're both extremely smart. They can get the big picture. They're used to making consequential decisions, risk analysis. They can sort of do it all, supposedly, but in practice, they tend to stumble. Well, you know, it's like... It reminds me, so many careers, the harder you work, there's a linear exponential outcome related to that. So if you're a doctor, the more you study, engineer, probably the more time you spend testing and designing, coming up with the ideas, you know, usually the better you get. And in investing, it's not necessarily the case. I mean, sure, if you're in a small niche or 40 years ago, you know, doing security analysis, the harder you work, but for the broad population, the more time you spend on investing, it's not necessarily a, a linear outcome. It could be a negative outcome. It could be negative. You'd be better off playing golf yeah. for the most part. Which is another thing for me, that the more time I spend, there's no out, no no improved outcome. <laughs> um, awful golfer. But I'd love to go. It's kind of like an outdoor happy hour for me. Okay, so let's, let's talk about a little bit about the world today. You're designing these portfolios, but how does the world look to you right now? 
where your client's asking you about Bitcoin? Is there anything, you know, in particular, we talk with Rob or not, and he has this great concept of over rebalancing. So kind of tilting portfolios. Are you kind of consistently updating theories and looking at new funds? Kind of what's, what's the world look like to you today? Well, to me, everything sort of looks expensive. And so it's just a question of what looks more expensive than others. Every quarter, I look at all of the funds that I own, all the different asset classes, and this will come as a great shock to you, but I put them in sort of a grudge match with each other, depending on uh, momentum, trend, and valuation. And I have different measures for all these things. And so I will tend to tactically tweak my allocation to all these things, depending on how they look. But then I also, you know, take a look at sort of the global macro picture. And I, I have a few metrics that I you know, look at for that. And nothing in my global outlook is telling me it's time to pull up the anchor on the arc and set sail. I've been fully invested. In fact, I've been over-invested, you know, ever since the financial crash. And it's been, you know, it, it seems like it would have been an easy time to be an investment manager, you know, since 2009. But actually, it's been somewhat difficult because every day you read, you know, 10 articles about how the sky is about to fall. We tend to be pretty quantitative about the valuation metrics, you know, and we just sent out a, our kind of quarterly valuation updates to the Idea Farm. And, and we've been saying this kind of same message for the last handful of years, which is the U.S. is expensive, but most of the world is reasonable to a lot of the world is actually really cheap. And there's not a whole lot of countries that are probably not even really any that are in bubble territory, which is usually pretty rare. Usually you have something going bananas and some sort of crisis. But right now it doesn't seem like there's that many things. And so I, I took to Twitter and Phil, you only tweet about every three months, but I, every, <laughs> I, I get them when you do. But I took to Twitter because I had a question. I said, you know, I spend so much time with valuation and almost every big money manager. So AQR, you mentioned GMO, research affiliates, Go on down the line. I might put about 20 of them on there, including Vanguard and Jack Bogle, say you should expect lower U.S. stock returns. And in some cases, you know, and that number goes all the way down from, I don't know, let's call it 7% nominal all the way down to like minus four or whatever GMO has, right? So everyone is saying that. So I took to Twitter and I said, actually, can anyone name a single shop that is expecting higher than historical returns. So, I mean, you think about it, it should be almost 50-50 given, you know, just the way the world works. Higher than expected returns over the next three to 10 years for U.S. stocks, which would be about 6.7% real or 10%-ish nominal returns. And we could, I couldn't find a single one. Out of 30,000 people we queried, you know, not a single person could find. And so that's the only thing that gives me pause is like, is there anything we're missing? Is there something that outside evaluation is causing the world to be, you know, the for U.S. stocks to actually not be that expensive. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's it's something that I did anyway that I was thinking about yesterday. I don't have any good answers, but as the psychologist, you know, I don't know if you put your hat on and have conversations with clients or the you know decades of studies you've done in market history. Any any thoughts on that? No, that's a perfect description of the environment that we're in. Virtually everybody expects low returns going forward. Nobody thinks, oh, the returns, I mean, maybe Elon Musk does, but nobody seems to think, oh, we're in for a bountiful return. Retirees have nothing to worry about because the market is going to go up, 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 and it's going to fill the pension funds and the IRAs, and everybody's going to be in great shape. But the thing is, it is not given to human beings to know the future. And human beings tend to have a pretty terrible ability to make these kinds of predictions, Somebody could invent a flying car tomorrow or, you know, cold fusion or some kind of breakthrough invention that will radically change life for the good. I don't, I'm not betting on it necessarily, but it, we just don't know the range of possible outcomes of the future. It's the beauty of, of the job we do. It's endlessly fascinating. <laughs> I don't have any answers. I mean, the, the thing, if I, if I had to summarize it, this would be kind of my guess, is that everyone knows that U.S. stocks are expensive, but given that bonds only yield a couple percent, they don't really know what else to do. So a lot of people just continue to own U.S. stocks. So if you look at the percent that investors have allocated to stocks over the last 70 years, you know, it's, it's really high. And, and that in and of itself is a great contrary indicator over time. 
But I don't know what the, like you mentioned, all the indicators and economic indicators are strong. You know, whether it's ISM or, you know, all these other things, nothing is really signaling warning signs other than valuation in my mind. Maybe there's some more. Anyway, but I think there's a lot of opportunity in form. But that's kind of the beauty of the global market portfolio in general is you end up owning the world. And as a good st- starting point, you also do a little bit, I think you mentioned in alternatives. Uh, yes, I took an interest in this, especially after 2008, wishing I had been more diversified than I uh, was at the time. Again, I assumed that if I own all these, you know, I own uh, stocks in emerging markets and I own stocks in foreign developed markets, stocks in the United States, and I owned uh, real estate inv- investment trusts, all these things. And they all just sank together like a stone. I thought, hmm, could have been a little more diversified. Could have, wish I had done a little more there. So that started me on this quest to find uh, liquid alternatives that I could uh, put clients in. And that's been a, a longstanding hobby. I've had uh, some disappointments along the way. But I've, I think in the last few years, I've finally come to a, a suite of funds that I tend to uh, and is there, is there any particular area? Does it tend towards, you know, is it long, short equity or managed futures yes. or yes. Um, Bitcoin? <laughs> yes. all, of the above. all of the above. Not, not, not Bitcoin. Well, I just saw that today that I think it's Sweden has an exchange traded Bitcoin and now Ethereum product where I love, I'm a casual observer, but, but love watching the fund innovation that comes out. I even saw today that Schiller was launching with Barclays a single stock Cape Ratio Fund in Canada. Anyway, so, but here's, the, my, my biggest problem is keeping up with all these. And I've been trying to get someone to write a newsletter for years on focusing on liquid alts just so I could pay them and read it, you know, because there's so <laughs> many of these and I would love to read these little profiles of all these funds and say, hey, no, no, you should never invest in this one because it's it's a terrible, terrible idea methodology. Anyway, maybe uh, maybe we can talk someone into doing it. But so a couple categories, any favorites, any that your thinking has kind of uh, evolved or? Well, again, the, the magic that we're looking for with these alternative investments is we want zero correlation to the stock market. Because as you know, most hedge funds have about a you know, 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7 correlation to the stock market. So you're paying a lot of money for a very thin slice of diversification. So I'm really looking for that diversification. So that's just an immediate screen. It's gotta have a very, very low correlation. It has to have somewhat reasonable expenses, and it should have it should have positive expected returns. And if it has positive actual returns, then I really like it. Yeah, it's gravy. All right, let's put on your psychology hat. You know, my my background was in biotech, and I love thinking about trying to. We we just saw the the recent Nobel went to Thaler, who you know has written a great book called Nudge, and talking a lot about psychology and you know, how we can muck up our decisions, but also kind of be aware of them so that aware of our plumbing and programming so we don't do it. So you talk a lot about behavioral problems. I mean, I, over confidence, over trading, yada, yada, we can go on. What are some of the most insidious ones? And what do you kind of think about it? And as from a, not only a psychologist, but also a practitioner, um, kind of, is there anything you implement as well to try to keep your clients from being their own worst enemy? Well, What's the worst thing a person can do? Typically, it's to sell out at the nadir of a market crash, which is, of course, exactly what everybody wants to sell out because it's just too painful to hang on to stocks at that point. So here is a trick, a technique that I use talking to clients at such a time, is I will listen to all their concerns endlessly. I will do as much hand-holding as I can, and I will point out the you know problems with selling at that time, doesn't really solve any problems, just, just creates a new problem of when are you gonna get back into the market, which of course is impossible to figure out then. But typically they say, you know, Phil, I really do wanna sell everything. And I'll say, okay, let's sell half. And they tend to go along with that, not realizing that I've kind of snuck in the idea of half. So I am very loath to let anybody completely liquefy themselves at those times. That's an interesting one because we've talked about in the podcast about this before where so many investors want to think only in binary terms. So I'm in or I'm out. And I have family members and we used to talk to him about this. My, my father is so bad about this where he'd, he'd have a position in silver 
and would just stress about it day in, day out. And maybe he liked to stress about it. I don't know. But he'd stress <laughs> about it and say, I don't know if I should hold it or I should keep it in or, you know, go sell it or what. And I said, just why don't you sell a quarter or come up with a plan to sell 10% each month or each quarter for the next five years. But I think part of the reason that people don't want to do that is because they secretly like to gamble. They secretly and I don't know what the psychological, you know, reasoning for this is, but but they want something to cheer for or because it's boring to be average and it's boring to kind of sell a quarter every year or something like that. I don't know. Any thoughts on that? I mean, it- no, people love to gamble. And uh, no, it's, it's very tough. When, when they say they want to sell all, what they're really saying is I want the pain to stop. I don't want to be in lying awake at night. And, uh, and that does tend to lead to this all or nothing thinking, which is not the smart way of proceeding. Much better to say, let's sell 10% this month and then re- reconvene next month, and maybe sell 10% then. They're, they don't want to be rational about it. They just want to be done. And that's kind of like, you know, as we've been managing money for over a decade now, you know, I've started to implement a lot more concepts that are not necessarily what we would can be considered to be the most optimal but rather it's the most optimal for people to stick with it. And usually that often means dialing down the volatility and risk to lower than it, it should be given their requirements, right? You know, a lot, of, a lot of people, it's hard to tell a young person, yeah, you just go ahead and be 100% in stocks, you know, because the, the compliance with that is probably pretty low. Any, any other major kind of behavioral, if you had to rank them, you know, ones that you think are particularly insidious or that pop up with your with your clients or yourself that you've experienced as well? Well, I experience all of them. Yeah, me too. (laughs) The only reason that I can invest at all is because I've made every single possible mistake. If if somebody wrote a book of of investment mistakes, I would be in every single chapter. That's number 10. It's a great idea for you. You can (laughs) maybe a little cathartic. I'm going to go through and talk about all my worst mistakes. That might be a good idea, Jeff. Good blog post for us. Jeff, it would be Jeff's ongoing weekly option trading uh, snafus. <laughs> Interesting. Well, well, I think I subscribe to a service to give me these reports over the phone once a week, you know, back in the day. I mean, what an idiot. But look, hey, man, the newsletter research business is a multi hundred million dollar business. And we have friends in that world. And I think there's a full spectrum of just like the investment business, just like everything, really, a full spectrum of high quality down to, to very poor quality. And I think most people, here's the challenge. I think most people would love to invest correctly. And there's such an education gap, which is such a shame, I think, on it's a lot to know and a lot to be aware of. So, all right, we had William Bernstein on and he's, he gave us an estimate. What percentage of people do you think could or should be managing their own portfolios? Ah, well, for William Bernstein, a great hero of mine. Love William Bernstein. That was a great podcast, by the way. Uh, so you already know what he said. <laughs> I don't remember what he said, but it would be, unfortunately, it would be a fairly low number. And as you were talking earlier, you were mentioning how it's an area, people can put a lot of time and effort into investing and have very little to show for it and even to have negative returns to show for it. So it's, it's a tough path to go down. And especially then you have Wall Street with its big supermarket of financial products, you know, the siren luring you towards the rocks at every point. So it's a very tough business to do by yourself unless you're willing to just be completely passive. You know, I'm going to buy a few index funds and I'm just never going to look at it again. But that's tough because you do tend to look at it. And it's, oh, it's going up. Oh, I like that. And oh, what about this fund here? This one's going up even more. <laughs> Why didn't I buy this one instead? So it's, it's a real trap. Yeah. You actually likened it. I mean, I had a quote from talking about Wall Street in general. He said, if your account statement is from a name brand Wall Street firm, I can surmise you are ensnared in one of their Venus flytraps. You're anesthetized. I can, can't ever pronounce words while I'm reading them. By the sticky sweet promise of money while the pod closed around you and now your fortune is slowly being digested for their benefit. That That's how the fame is played. Which is, I actually used to have a Venus flytrap. It's a really hard plant to keep alive, by the way. (laughs) Anyway. Well, doesn't Uh, it grab your hand at night while you're sleeping and try to... I know. I'm bad at plants in general. My my green thumb is is black, I think. We we just had to get rid of all... We had to take all of our plants out of our house just because we got termite 
fumigated. So I had to, it's good news because you end up cleaning out the house, but bad news because I had to move. It was, I was trying to watch the Broncos and my wife was like, we got to move all of our plants now. And I'm like, oh my <laughs> God, you have got to be kidding me. <laughs> Let's pause for a moment to hear again from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Roofstock, the leading online marketplace for buying and selling leased single family rental homes. I actually interviewed Roofstock's founders, Gary and Gregor, back in episode 63. And I was genuinely impressed with how these guys are radically simplifying rental real estate investing. The process used to be incredibly time intensive. First, you had to identify a market, look at tons of homes, then do some due diligence, make some offers, negotiate the price, and finally buy. And then you had to find a property manager to handle leasing and operations for you. What a nightmare. I've always been gun shy about rental real estate investing due to these various operational headaches that can come with it. But Roofstock has changed all that. Every one of these properties comes leased up and pre-certified by the Roofstock team. They even connect you with vetted property managers who handle all of the day-to-day headaches for you. They browse properties all over the country, including locally here in Los Angeles and even my hometown in Winston-Salem. And learn more about how to generate real estate income with peace of mind, visit roofstock.com forward slash meb. Again, that's roofstock.com forward slash meb. And now back to the show. I want to transition to your newest book. And in, in listeners of the podcast, you hear the name of this book. Don't turn this off because this is probably the most useful. And this is one of my, Phil, this is one of my favorite books I've read in investing. And the reason why is because it's infinitely useful. So we spend most of our time on this podcast talking about investments and how to construct your portfolio and best practices and things not to do. But one of the biggest determinants of final return is avoiding taxes. And, you know, so you'd written the overtax investor, slash your tax bill and be a tax alpha dog. And I highly recommend everyone listening to this, buy this book because it's very specific and it talks about all of these concepts and ideas and things you can put into practice. So let's talk about this book. Well, what was the motivation for writing this? And then we can start to talk about some of the various tax tips and ideas for investors can put into place. So what 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 caused you to write your ninth book? Well, I was I had a, my own taxes were completely impenetrable because we had a little family business that issued some some K ones and it was filed in six states. Never made any money except for the attorneys and the accountants, but it made my taxes impossible to understand. We got rid of the family business. And suddenly I could just look at my naked little tax form and I said, wait a minute, what are all these taxes I'm paying on uh, dividends and capital gains? Where is this all coming from? So that caused me to take a very, very hard look at my investment practices. And I realized that just as for years I'd been preaching about you know, keeping investing expenses low, expense ratios on mutual funds, ETFs, stuff like that, I realized that there was now a similar crusade to be launched about keeping investing taxes low. Because, you know, in California, if you're a high bracket earner, you can pay 33% of your dividends every year just straight to the Franchise Tax Board and the U.S. Treasury. So this is a huge area. And it's also, it's a free lunch. If, if I can, other things equal, save you money on your taxes, that all goes straight to your bottom line. So this is a great area of focus for advisors, I think. And this is one of the biggest, I think, advisor alphas. You know, we talk a lot about advisors and, and I've kind of made the comment that the asset allocation, which is what many advisors focus on, is probably one of the least important relative to these other buckets. Behavioral coaching we talked about, but tax alpha and I mean, it takes me at least a week or two a year to do, I mean, like full time to do my taxes. It's such a nightmare. But if you can do the little tricks and make sure you optimize, I mean, it's probably by far the biggest amount of alpha that an individual or even, you know, a company can add. And so let's talk about a few. So what what are kind of the, some of the biggest tax tips you can name for investors they can kind of take away from optimizing their investments? Well, I suppose the biggest one for most people Uh, that most people fail to do properly is they should fund their retirement accounts to the max every year. 
and ideally fund the right kind, a Roth or a traditional IRA or 401k. People don't tend to do it because they prefer to have spending money right now, which is nice to have, but it's even nicer to have when you're 85 years old and standing in a bread line someplace. So it's very important to do that. It's a real tax benefit built into the tax code. Everybody should do it. That's just one, that's just basic. Beyond that, I think people, there are some clever things people can do with parking the right kind of assets and the right kind of accounts. So to the extent to which you have tax-deferred accounts and or tax-free accounts versus taxable accounts, you want to park the right kinds of uh, investments in each of those. You want to park your tax-intensive assets like bonds or real estate investment trusts or a lot, a lot of the liquid alternatives tend to work better in IRA accounts, 401k, qualified accounts. And your accounts that you just want to grow to the sky, like a Roth account, you should go for broke, packing your best, highest growth investment ideas. And taxable accounts, you need to invest that in a way that's very tax sensitive because the tax man has his hand out every year and is going to be reaching into your pocket for his cut. So there's a couple, I mean, a lot of these are kind of basic one-on-one ideas, but they make a huge impact. I mean, one that many investors aren't aware of is, I mean, simply mutual funds that have high turnover. And a lot of people don't even know this. I mean, you can invest in a mutual fund that may be down on the year and end up having a huge tax bill because it's of its turnover and gains that it's it's had to it's had and, and withdrawals and everything else goes on in it. Done that. <laughs> I've had I've had that happen to yeah. me. Yes indeed. Yeah. I know it well. I need to give you a compliment, Phil, because I don't know if it was subliminal or it kind of put a bug in my brain and then I forgot about it and, and rethought about it months later because I read this book. I've been trying to get Phil on the podcast, by the way, for like a year. And Phil said, all right, well, let's come on when the, the, the tax, you know, Trump just got elected or he said pre prior election, he said, I'll come on when the tax situation is more clear. <laughs> and so three months ago by, I said, well, Phil, it doesn't look like it's getting clear. He says, I know, but let's maybe wait a bit. Three months goes by, three months goes by. So I said, Phil, did you just come on the podcast and we'll do another one once it's clear, if and, if and when it ever gets any more clear. But so I'd read your book and loved it. And first thought was, man, I need to get my own house in order. Second thought is I read this chapter on, it was you sitting down with Ben, I think in Warren Buffett, having a lunch conversation or a meeting but this concept of zero dividends. You want to talk a little bit about that? Because we, we, it's been an area that we've now written a paper on. It's not out yet, but we're almost done. Um, that echoes a lot of these sentiments. You want to kind of roll with that idea and I'll, I'll, I'll chime in as, as we kind of talk about it. Right. Well, this is what I came to first really with my own account. I looked at my taxable account and said, what are all these dividends and capital gains I'm getting from mutual funds and whatnot? It's time to clean house a little bit. So to the extent to which I could, I got rid of anything that was issuing me a dividend check or you know year-end distributions of any kind. And I said, well, now what? I've got to buy something that's not going to pay a dividend. But then that's sort of... And, that, and that's crazy, though. I mean, the, the, all the retirees listening to this are, if they're still listening at this point, <laughs> they're starting to talk about taxes, but everyone listening to this is, whoa, wait a second, Phil, wait a second, Meb. I mean, dividends is like the most time-honored investment approach on the planet. And you're saying that maybe you should be avoiding them. And, and that's pretty... That's probably one of the top five investment... Like if you had to have like a investment commandments, you know, that's probably top five dividend investing, yield investing that people love because they want those quarterly checks, right? But you're saying maybe maybe that's not ideal. Well, and they're right. I mean, I'd even written a book about dividend investing, proposing it. And dividends are fabulous. I, I love them as a value investor and I love them for, for retirees. To the extent to which you're going to be spending the money, dividends are great. But if you're still in your working career and you've got 20 years before retirement and the government's just taking a third of your dividends every year, that's not so great. So in that respect, it put me back in the position of saying, okay, so how can I get the benefits like dividend investors get but without getting the dividend? So it put me in a very strange niche in the investment universe. So the first place I turned to uh, was to my paraguru, Warren Buffett. 
And I realized that one of the ways that he's been able to get so phenomenally wealthy is by owning Berkshire Hathaway stock, which famously, I won't say it's never paid a dividend because the first year he owned it, it paid a 10 cent dividend. He immediately got rid of that. And it's never paid a dividend since, even though if they chose to pay a dividend, it would be a you know, a five or six figure sum for as far as I can yeah, tell. There's a great quote because he says, you know, we never paid a dividend. Just kidding. He's like, I, let me correct that. We paid one once, but I think I must have been in the bathroom when the board right. decided exactly. to issue a dividend. <laughs> so Berkshire Hathaway, of course, is a holding company and he owns many, many businesses that do themselves pay dividends and he gets some tax, he gets taxed somewhat on that, but still the net tax, the flow through tax to me is nil. So then I said, well, what are other companies like Berkshire Hathaway that are out there? And by the way, there are many people that would just say Berkshire Hathaway full stop. I know a lot of people whose entire net worth is Berkshire Hathaway, and they seem to be doing just fine in the world. But to me, that seems a little bit under diversified, even as fabulous as a company as it is. So I started looking for other companies like Berkshire Hathaway and conservative, really conservatively run insurers that have big investment portfolios on the side. I started looking at hedge funds that were offered through some kind of vehicle like Third Point or Greenlight Capital. So that was another way I went to look. And then finally, it sort of put me back in the position that I thought I would never be in of being an individual stock picker. The one thing that I never claimed to know anything about, and suddenly I'm doing it. So my take on this whole thing has been to try to construct a somewhat diversified portfolio of zero dividend stocks to the extent to which I can, given that I'm not a company analyst. I'm trying to sort of just look back at a business, say, is this business likely to be here in the next 20 years? Does it have some kind of runway ahead of it? Does it seem to be solidly run? Is it profitable? Is it a quality business? And uh, do they have an ongoing use for new capital? So they aren't going to be tempted to pay it back to me where I'll have to pay taxes on it. So I'm looking for businesses like this, and then I, uh, then I make investments in them. And so there's very little in the academic literature about this. You know, you and I discussed, there's a couple papers, I want to say, by some folks at AQR, maybe Chicago, but not a lot in there, and so we started fiddling around with this. What's and, the answer? Tell me. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get we'll, we'll go down the the rabbit hole. So, for the first thought was, okay, what if I could just invest in the S and P, but not take any dividends? What's the difference for a taxable investor? And so you can go look up actual tax, and this obviously gets very complicated quick with different tax brackets, and so you make some simplifications, right? But if you said, okay, since the seventies. If you're low tax, high tax bracket, liquidation, no liquidation, in general, you could save up to about a percent return per year in the S&P by not paying that dividend tax every quarter or every year, right? Now, in some cases, it doesn't matter if it's in a, you know, IRA, it doesn't matter if it's in, you know, certain accounts, but if it's a taxable account and you're in your high net, this is particularly insidious for high net worth investors. You, you could save about a percent a year. So then that started us going down the path of saying, well, what if... So then it went to, okay, well, what about all these high dividend investors? Because we all know the dividend stocks outperform and then high dividend yielders outperform that and typically growers and payers outperform non-payers and companies that don't pay dividends in general. That's kind of the... But I said, well, that's in a tax exempt world, what about taxable? And so if dividends outperform by about a percent or two per year, what about after tax? And so we kind of went through that study and then said, well, actually, what are dividends at their core? It's really just a tilt towards value. And so we said, well, what if, and then we looked at value and value does, value is a factor does better than dividends, at least historically. But what if we could replicate value? The original idea is, could we replicate dividends with stocks that don't pay a dividend? And that's hard until you say, well, what, if, what, are we, what are we really getting at? And that's value. And if you look at value and start to cut off the universe of, we're going to avoid the top quartile of high yield, then the top 50, then top 75, then all dividend stocks. It's actually tough in the US because 
most many stocks pay a dividend, right? Till you get down to like the Russell 3000. Anyway, the answer was <laughs> the long winded aside was that your thoughts and theories are all correct. And that if you use value or approaches that avoid the highest yielding, even just the, the you know top quarter or half of the dividend universe, taxable investor is much better off investing in those sort of strategies than investing in the high dividend ones. Fascinating. Yeah. And Music so, to my ears. <laughs> yeah, right. So now, again, tax exempt doesn't matter as much, but it's really interesting because you start to look at a lot of these, whether it's robo portfolios or asset allocation ideas, it kind of turns some things on its head, particularly for younger investors. And it, again, it gets more nuanced for retirees, but I think you're onto something. Well, it's interesting. I have kind of was feeling my way through this universe. And how I've tended to diversify it is I have a lot of the zero dividend portfolios in what I would call low beta stocks, these insurers and things like that. And then I've also, because I'm, I, I don't know, I'm a whore for performance or something, I've also picked a few technology stocks that look to me like you know, the exact opposite of anything Warren Buffett would ever buy. So I also own a few things, you know, like Alibaba or Baidu or even Amazon. And on the view that, again, these seem to be companies that might be around for a long time. They can grow. They can reinvest their earnings. And they will probably tend to do well in times when the insurers are not doing well. And the insurers will probably tend to do well in times when these things all are having hard times. So I kind of have a bipolar portfolio of these kinds of investments. When I started offering it to clients, I said, please tell me you didn't call it the zero dividend portfolio. (laughs) Because when we're thinking of the marketing world, you got your psychology hat back on. I mean, there are hundreds of dividend ETFs and income ETFs. And there are hundreds, if not thousands of mutual funds. And how many ever hundreds of billions invested in those sort of strategies. And so it's so ingrained. I I feel like we probably, we've filed for a couple of these ideas, but trying to think of the right name so that in, it's, it's going to be like the least popular concept ever. So did, did you actually say, hey, I got this great idea? Yes. I, I said, <laughs> we, we call them zeros. It's sort of like, oh the mar- like, like the mark of Zorro. You're worse than I am on the marketing side. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I told clients, look, here's what's well, going to happen. It was funny because going back to your email, you had actually went on that. You said, you said and you were talking about zeros and you linked to a paper. I thought you were talking about zero coupon bonds. <laughs> and these academic papers oh, yes. are so long and I, they, they're complex. They're written for, I think, other academics and no one else. So I spent about half the time looking in that paper for zero coupon bonds <laughs> and trying to find what you're talking about. Zero dividend payers. It all makes sense now. Okay, keep going. So you're talking to your client. And I say... Look, this portfolio is going to underperform the market. That's the only thing I'll promise you. You're going to underperform the the S&P 500 by two percentage points a year. But in the long run, you'll thank me for it because you're going to make make it all back after tax. Well, the good news is I don't think it's going to underperform. No, it's, it's outperformed. So my clients all think I'm some kind of genius, but I'm not. I'm kind of just stumbling through. And here's one virtue of it. And that is that when I make a mistake, it doesn't tend to be a big mistake. Because if it's a mistake, I'll, you know, if I see the stock's down 3%, I sell it. Good riddance. I've got other ideas. So the portfolio tends to be a portfolio of winners, even though in the short run, I can make mistakes along the way. And that's the beauty of it. If you can just match the S&P or the Russell or whatever your benchmark is, then on an after-tax basis, everything else is gravy. And so we found, and, and it gets complicated because... You know, obviously the value factor is, is backwards looking and it may not work as much as it used to. But I mean, you're, you're talking about getting up to one, two, three, four percentage point outperformance versus some of these other highly taxable because you go, you go back, by the way, historically, I mean, dividends have been taxed at all sorts of different rates, zero personal income, which at one point was like the highest was like, what, 80, 90 percent or something crazy. Who knows, fast forward three months, what, what the if any tax stuff will get passed. If it does, we'll have you back on. But it's kind of like all you got to do is match and anything else is gravy. But I don't know any, hard, I really don't know almost anyone else talking about this or doing this. 
Do you? I don't so far. It seems to me like it should be it should be a growth area because there's there's actually money on the table to be had for somebody that can put this in a bottle. What we talked about and and, and it's interesting because like as, as a lot of these automated solutions start to transition to individual positions as well, this is one that Betterment, Vanguard, Schwab, Wealthfront, if you're listening, you know, to where you could build these portfolios that are you know, totally different depending on a person's age and time frame, and and like you mentioned, tax location. So whereas in the taxable side of the portfolio, you may be investing in value zeros. We got to come up with a better name. <laughs> but in the tax exempt, you could be investing in high dividends, and it, and it would end up balancing. You know, um, we did, one of the things that we talked a lot about was the old. One of the things that the dividends really have a good job of is a good brand. And it was the old Coke versus Pepsi sort of concept where the older listeners of this podcast, there was Pepsi. We used to have taste tests and have commercials where they would blind taste tests and give people Coke and Pepsi. And almost universally, people preferred Pepsi. And then Coke said, that's not true. So they went and did it and found that also people preferred Pepsi, you know, because but but people when told what they were preferred Coke because of whatever they associated with the colors or the polar bears or whatever it may be. And I think dividends have a lot of that same. By the way, we, we mentioned this on the podcast and we got about 10 responses from people saying, no, no, the test was flawed, by the way, because Pepsi's sweeter or Malcolm Gladwell <laughs> disproved this, whatever. My point is, I think dividends have a great brand. And so a lot of people can associate with it. And, and behaviorally speaking, it, it makes a lot of sense for retirees too, if it keeps them you know, from, from behaving correctly. What I wonder what other like type of brands there are in investing that cause people um, to invest suboptimally. Is there anything that's like off top of your head? I would think home country bias would be a big one where people think of their own. Do you see that a lot with your investors where they want to be invested most in the U.S.? Or when they come to you with portfolios? Well, of course. And since this is, you know, true confessions, my portfolios are not global weighted. They are overweighted towards the U.S. versus the global market. Although they do tend to be much more weighted towards the f- foreign stocks compared to anybody else that I yeah. talk to, and I always hear complaints about this. That's funny, you know. It's and, and we talked. So I just did a podcast yesterday with a fellow in China, and and Asia, our Asian friends are are probably the worst as far as if you look at the statistics, just on a math basis on the overweight they do their own markets. I mean, everyone's bad. Aussie's bad. Italian's bad. Everyone's bad about it. But it's fascinating because it makes sense, you know, the same way that I cheer for the Broncos and everything else, but it can lead to some suboptimal outcomes. But it, Jack Bogle says, you don't even need foreign at all, really. <laughs> so it's uh, interesting. But I want, I, I mean, I'm just brainstorming here. I'm trying to think of what other good brands or, you know, time honored investment truths there are that are not, you know, necessarily true. Well, zero dividend stocks deservedly have a bad reputation because they, on mass, they're probably not as good unless you apply a tax screen. And even there, I'm thinking you probably should be, there are probably other things you should be thinking about than just buying all of them, but maybe not. Maybe buying all of them is the answer. You're frustrating me because you're giving me ideas for like 10 more offshoots to this white paper. So here, I'm going to give you the white paper and we can turn it into your 10th book. You can write the, the zero dividend portfolio and it will sell five, five copies. It's completely under-researched. E- even the papers that are out that discuss it are not really there to talk about the performance of non-dividend paying stocks. They're talking about something else and this just happens to be a sidelight of something they stumbled upon. Yeah, because I I'd started reading all your various posts and Forbes and your blog and elsewhere because I remember trying to read the paper and just my eyes rolling back in my head and but found that you in your book you teased out some of the charts that I couldn't even find or probably didn't even read. So, but I probably but made them up. Very, very in exhibit 75C, <laughs> you were able to do it. And so listeners, seriously, check out, check out Phil's book, The Overtaxed Investor, because it has some concepts here. And, and, you know, there's some structures that Wall Street has made that also avoid dividends and income. So like an exchange traded note. Now, these have become very unpopular for two reasons. One, is there a credit liability to the issuer. And so when Lehman imploded, people gave up exchange traded notes forever. And the other part is you typically have to pay the bank for the swap, which can be or for the note, which can be expensive on its own, 
you know, so you're already getting hit 50, 100 basis points for what you're trying to replicate. But the cool news is it doesn't pay any dividends or anything. I think Fisher seeded two exchange traded notes on equities for this reason. He put like $800 million and I can't remember what ETF shop we'll, we'll link to in the show notes, but kind of not directly to this concept, but did it as a note so that it wouldn't be paying income. I have not looked into that. Yeah, I'll be fascinated either, but it's, to find out yeah, but how so, it happened. But so there's just thinking about structures. I mean, hedge funds notoriously are very tax inefficient. Well, I, but the hedge fund is the is the right structure. You want to have an LP of zero dividend paying stocks because that way the, you get a pass through of all the capital uh, losses. That that's another thing that you know you the tax harvesting you know, is an area that, you know, making sure that, you know, ETFs are pretty good at it, but yeah. again, they can't pass through the losses, right? They can, they can defer, you can avoid, and then that's kind of up to the advisor or individual to make sure that their holistic portfolio is, is tax efficient. So what else, what, what else was in this tax book? We went down the zero, you talk a lot about all sorts of other ideas. There's, there's one quote you had, I'm looking Uh-oh. at your tax tips. It's not a quote, but there's some obvious ones that I think most people are familiar with. Draw down your accounts in the correct order after you retire. Don't give cash to charities. Donate appreciated assets. I, I, I feel like a lot of people don't do that. Very smart, very rich people don't do that. It's time to give to charity. So they reach for their checkbook and where they've got all these huge capital gains sitting on their tax bill account. So I, I consider that a great public service to be able to donate a prescription. Is, is it usually just because they don't know about it, or is it they just compartmentally compartmentalize both? The in, in, in some cases, they don't know, and in some cases, they just think, well, here's the checkbooks. That's how I've always done it, is by opening my checkbook. Interesting. It's funny, because so many of these I'm guilty of as well. We, we were donating, I think, the profits from this last book we did, and I hadn't even thought about donating shares. <laughs> but anyway, all right. So you got another one. You say, call your state attorney because the old will you drafted during the Coolidge administration is wrong. What do you mean wrong? Well, it's probably not suited for the present environment. Most people don't really need much in the way of a will. Okay. So let's say, let's say someone wants to get a will or they need to update it. What's the best way? Do they go online, fill it out themselves? They get a, a state attorney. What's the ballpark cost? I don't, I, I don't think I don't have one. So tell, tell me, do what too. do I, what, I, I don't, I think it is, uh, it, uh, Wait, but you're with, with a, a new child yeah. in place. This is the perfect time. Shame, shame me. All right. So what do I do? Do I go online? Do I, no, uh, no. How, do, how do I find someone to draft a will for me? By talking to your friends that are similarly situated that have an, a probate attorney that they love. Okay. But of course the other problem now is that with everything up in the air, is Trump going to eliminate the estate tax? If he does, what's going to happen to the capital gains step up at death? It, it, there are a lot of scenarios there where eliminating the estate tax might not be a good thing for a lot of high net worth people who are not ultra high net worth. So, you know, in your case, or in the case of a person who needs a will, I would put something together, uh, some kind of flexible document, and then review it after something does or doesn't happen politically. But so, but, but the correct kind of line of events is talk to your financial advisor, get them to recommend a probate attorney. That would be great. What if they don't have an advisor? Where do they go? They go to their rich friends, their, okay. their prosperous friends. I said, all I wanted to do and write into my will, I told my wife this the other night and just kind of watched her stare at me in disbelief for about 20 seconds. I said, the first thing, so if I kick the bucket, I want like a, a Viking funeral where... <laughs> You push me out onto a lake, you know, and then they shoot the arrow and then it burns in the middle of the lake. And I said, but then I'm going to establish like a, like a, a fund. And so I'm going to nominate five friends or 10 and they all have to take archery lessons. And then so they all get their own flaming arrows and they get five and whoever hits it gets another bucket of money, which then they have to do the Richard Pryor. What was the movie where he had to spend all the money? Brewster's oh, Millions. Yeah. And then they have to go. And, and she just sat there. It's just like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> what is wrong with you? These She's are like, plans. no one's going to let you do that on a lake. I said, okay, sub clause B, you have to put this first pot of money to buy a lake somewhere, you know, and this is going to be in some country that allows you to have Viking funerals on their lake. Put this all in writing. Yeah. Get the court to ratify it. It sounds so, like a good plan. All right, I'm going to ask you afterwards to give me a good probate attorney and, and put this into, and who won't 
um, also certify me as being insane and say this person needs to be locked up somewhere. Here's another tax tip that I didn't even understand. So use the God-given statutory tax shelters laid out before you like a land of dreams. What in the world does that mean? Well, I was listening to the CPA guru, uh, Robert Keebler, give a talk. And uh, he, he's a big tax guy. And he was doing a report on taxes, on estate taxes. And he went to his shelves and he pulled out all of the files from people that had an estate tax problem. And he looked at them and he realized that every one of these people that had an estate tax problem had one way or another been involved in maximizing the value of statutory tax shelters in one way or another. And from this perspective, having an estate tax problem is a good thing. These are people that had too much money and they needed to do something about it. This is a problem we'd all like to have. And so the statutory tax shelters, there's a, there's a chapter on this in the book that sort of runs through them, but they start out with things that are as basic as funding your IRA every year. The IRA is a statutory tax shelter. But then it goes, can go into things like oil and gas investments, real estate, sort of correct management of accounts. You just want to, you want to play all the angles in your favor so you keep as much money for you and give as little of it to the uh, Treasury Department as you can. Just talking to you, so many things keep always popping into my head when you talk about taxes. So when my father passed a handful of years ago, we had a family farm. So immediately start having to learn an enormous amount about taxes, but not just various taxes, but also, and of course he didn't have a will, so no Viking funeral for him. But so all these various taxes where not only was it you know federal, but also then what is Kansas tax law? And then we find out, oh wait, if the farm is more than 50% of the estate, it like doesn't get taxed at all, but then it gets set up as a family farm and it's a huge difference. And so it creates all these different incentives where like, where, and, and literally the farm was half of the estate. So we're like 48%. We're like, man, can we get it to 51? Can we find some appraisers yeah. that are- Plant some soybeans. Yeah. And so find some appraisers that are particularly incentivized to give us a high appraisal. But then like we couldn't get it there. So then we wanted as low as appraisal as possible. IRS, if you're listening, ignore a low appraisal as possible. So then we didn't have, but it's just so funny. It is so complicated. I can't think, I mean, the probably return on my investment for the time I spend on taxes is so- why, why is the system so complicated? It is a complete mess. Just I mean, government it's, it's, is just it's astonishing. The guy I like to read here is John Cochran or Cochrane. It's uh, he's up at Stanford, but he writes very intelligently about the tax code. And his idea for tax simplification is basically that we need to divorce the idea of using the tax code for political purposes to redistribute income because everybody has some particular goal about some subgroup they think needs to be specially subsidized and instead focus just on making the tax code raise the money. And ideally, he would I think he wants to do it through a consumption tax, which is a pretty simple way of doing it. And then have the political discussion about, okay, well, who are we going to subsidize? Are we going to subsidize people that buy real estate? Are we going to subsidize people that buy stock or subsidize poor people? What, all those discussions can be a separate issue, but let's raise the money first and then decide how to handle it. A couple of points. So one is, it's funny, and I'm a political independent, but I remember looking back at a lot of these, Ross Perot used to have a bunch of great charts on his website. I'll have to look it up and we'll add it to the show notes if he still does. But everyone who's older remembers Ross Perot's charts when he was running for president. And But he had all these great charts on his website. I mean, one of them is was like, taxes is a percentage of GDP. And I remember thinking, it doesn't vary that much. Like it was always around, I think, 20%. It doesn't matter if it's Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter where the taxes came from. Like that was the spending and income and of the government in general, ballpark. But it's not like it was 50 or 5%. Like it was always around 20. So I was like, that that's so fascinating to me that regardless of outcome, but taxes, which sound like such a boring topic. I mean, if you read history tax history books and economic history in the U.S. What's the guy's name? Is it Steele Gordon? Again, show notes. But you, you, when they intro your book, you talked about, I mean, you're like, when the U.S. went from a 1% to 2% tax, like it, it created a revolution and a war. You know, people started going crazy. And then you, I think you talked about, was it 
Louis the Fourteenth in France or someone, you know. And so these, and, and that's back when it was only one or two percent, and now that it's many dozens of percents. Um, I totally forgot where I was going with this. Well, we've gotten but. used to living in a very heavily taxed society. And one of the ideas about taxes is that they should at least be numerous and small rather than single and big. And, and we've really gotten the numerous part down. They're just, you, you can't move without being taxed. There's, I remember reading one of Jim Rogers' old books where he talked about the sugar farmers in the U.S. and the subsidies they get. He's like, right. look, we would be better off telling them all to close down and then just buying them all a Porsche every year. Right. And then, you know, allowing <laughs> allowing it to be a free market because it's not a free market. And, you know, I, I experienced that as a farmer. I mean, we, we get a lot of subsidies and I get there's reasons, but there's so many convoluted interests. And if you watch something like House of Cards, you're like, this can't be really what it's like. And then you read the newspaper and you're like, oh my God, this is Well, so... it's very beneficial for a small family farmer yeah. such as yourself. Well, we're we're probably the world's worst family farmer. I mean, the <laughs> I've had, it's funny, we talked about on the podcast, we when we I had a combine burn down like a year or two ago. I'm like, who does this happen to? And then I got all these emails <laughs> from listeners that were like, hey, I, I was on a combine when it burned down. And I was like, really? Does this thing actually happen? happens like it wasn't some sort of weird arson um funny to think about but yeah it's it's an endless source of frustration i just got a the irs sent me an email the other or sent me a letter the other day it's like you owe two thousand dollars because this 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 is wrong and i spent like an hour or two going through it i'm like i can't even figure it out right and so right. if i'm going to spend 10 more hours on it it's gonna be worth my time just to pay it just like the frustration arbitrage of the irs like i i, I can't even figure out if it's wrong or not that's the world we live in. Yeah. Well, and you talk about a lot of other ideas in in the book. I remember you talking about chair was you talking about charities and how many charities pay their this is a total tangent. Pay their like a million dollar salary to the charity the person that's running the charity. Was that you talking about this? <laughs> yeah, running a charity turns out to be a great business. This is something I'm thinking of looking into. In fact, this might even be a book. book. It could could be a book, but the the idea of having a private foundation, you can just run with that forever, tax wise, because you have almost no oversight. The only way anybody's going to investigate your corrupt private foundation is if you're unlucky enough to get into the headlines, or if you piss somebody off and they call up the state attorney general's office and say this guy is you know bamboozling the, us through this, this so called charity. But it's just amazing how many really awful charities there are out there. And they, they have a wonderful tax structure uh, wrapped around them. So I'm surprised. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. I should be surprised they're not more bad charities. Mm. I mean, that's a pretty good salary, a million bucks. We, I think a lot about some of those structures. I mean, we, we had looked into, I know, the U.S. Virgin Islands as well as Puerto Rico economic incentive structures. And U.S. Virgin Islands got a little more a higher bar, but Puerto Rico was, was still, I mean, and who knows, they may expand those at this point, the amount of flight and all the tragedy going on there. But we said, well, we also start after we, we have to start making some money before we move our, our office down to Puerto Rico. But I don't think a financial con- company can move there. I think, I think a research or publishing, but I don't, so maybe we'll move the idea farm to Puerto Rico. At, at well, I, you know, the whole idea was to try to get hedge funds to move there. Yeah. So there's probably a way. Hmm. Oh, because, well, there was two levels. There was the personal level. So on you could avoid capital gains and dividend taxes. And I'm totally, I used yeah, to know stuff the rules. like that. And then there was the corporate level. So there's, in the corporate, you didn't have to live there. The personal, you did have to live there most of the year, whatever it was. Right. Anyway, right. it'll be interesting to see how that all I mean, it was such a tragedy in Puerto Rico. And so the thing about charity is it's cool now that you have these kind of quant websites, I think. Uh, maybe Charity Navigator, Give Well, that will examine like what percentage of these charities spend on operations versus actually donations. And some of the the political ones that are started by celebrities, I mean, my God, it's they're some of the worst. They don't like distribute any of the money. They just spend <laughs> it on fundraisers and everything else. So um, who knows? But Okay. I haven't even lost track of my nine pages of what we're even talking about at this point. Um, so, Phil, what do, what, do, what do you learned over the past decade? You've written a lot of books. What's, what's kind of been the biggest um, things you've changed the mind, your mind about or kind of thoughts and experiences working with clients? What have you really learned 
through pain. I've been greatly confirmed in knowing that everything I always thought was right. Actually, actually, that's not true. You know, I thought you were going to follow that up by saying I didn't know a lot was right. <laughs> <laughs> the books have been an important part of my own self-education. Since I came into the field of finance really as a lateral shovel pass from psychology, I sort of felt the need to educate myself. So it's been an autodidact, and I've been sort of going through that process. I think that the luckiest day of my life was the day that I read Bogle on Mutual Funds, and I got out of the glamorous world of performance chasing, and that was a very uh, sobering experience, uh, and it caused me to look at things more statistically, more rationally, and uh, after I read that book about five times, I finally understood it, and that that was my life-changing moment back in the 90s. Since then, it's mostly been tweaks on one thing or another. I tend to get too excited about something at any given time. Oh, alternatives, these are going to these are going to be great. I'll, you know, I have I no need to worry about how the market's doing ever again. I'm just going to have these beautiful portfolios that march up every year. So I, I get too excited about them from time to time, but then I somehow manage to uh, pull myself back and the train goes forward. What's got you most excited these days that you're thinking about? I mean, it seems like you always have a topic or an idea or concept you're working on. What's 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 been the summertime project or going into into 2017? Anything on the brain? Well, the continuing to try to research zero dividend stocks and figure out which ones are the best ones to buy for the long run and which ones, if any, I should be particularly avoiding. That's been that's a constant preoccupation of mine. And then lately, I've also been interested in charities. I, I think the the state of philanthropy in the United States is a national disgrace. It's a national scandal. I don't know why it's not on the front page of the New York Times. Meaning every day. how they're run, or like how much people contribute. What What do you mean by disgrace? Meaning that, in some total, if you took all the money that was given to charities over the last ten years, and you asked yourself, has any social good been accomplished with this money? It's not clear whether the answer to that is yes. There's There's another website that tries to quantify. Oh, man, what is the name of it? We'll have to add it to show notes. It tries to quantify the greatest amount of good that can be done per dollar. So it's like, you know, um, buying mosquito nets in Africa, you know, is a high return on investment. And there's, and I can't, I can't remember the name well, of the, it. Well, the GiveWell site give well, is, is, give well? is terrific. It was started by some hedge funders trying to just give away some money on their own. That Well, we'll just research charities the way we research businesses. And uh, we'll come up with some and we'll all be happy. And then, again, even their story is a scandalous story because they started doing this. Go on. And, and, and they've, they've been looking uh, for years and years and years at charity after charity. And they've come up with a list of maybe, you know, five or ten charities that they like. And then sometimes even some of those get knocked off the list. So if you think about the tens of thousands of charities out there and the ones that actually make any kind of a cut... It's a very uh, sad story. We had on a another psychologist talking about, and this is an area we can talk about maybe for a minute before starting to wind down. She, she was talking about, you know, we all focus so much on money management and investing and saving money. But she says, really, most people spend very little time optimizing on how to then spend it. So whether it's their own personal life, um, you know, buying... And and she gives like maybe five suggestions. Have you read this book called Happy Money? It's a, heard of it. I've okay. not read it. Good. I'll send you a copy. What's the answer? Well, the answer is it's a lot of common sense stuff. But going back to the behavioral nudges, it's common sense stuff. Kind of just like, hey, here's how to be in shape. You eat less and work out more. You know. But how many <laughs> people do that? So same thing with money. You know, save save more, spend less. But but it's like. Spend money on experiences, not things, you know, so that really shiny car or purchase may seem drool worthy, but fast forward a few months and you're like, eh, whatever. But, you know, that trip to Africa you've always wanted to do with your family that you pay for ahead of time is another one that you, you know, pay for purchases. So you have a long lead time to be able to kind of fantasize about it. And uh, there's a handful of other ones. So they're, they're kind of common sense. But again, it's like, how do people, do people actually do it? And, and trying to, you know, set up systems to make sure that you do is um, a little more challenging, but to be thoughtful about it. Giving money is a big one. So people get, you know, a lot of emotional benefit from 
spending money on others. But that's the problem, too, because it's it's very easy if I write a check or I give money to somebody, I feel great about it. But not necess- I don't deserve to feel great about it because the question is how much good am I actually doing with that money? So that's why I want to try to nudge people away from just the, f- the feel-good moment. And that's what charities pander to. And if I ran a charity, I'd do the same thing. I'd have baby seals and orphans, or, or you can turn the page. I would do all that, because that's where the money is. That's how the money comes in the door that pays my salary. But selling a feel-good experience is not the same thing as actually doing good in the world. So that's and so that's the is, would you say the recommendation of the in person is to you either need to spend a lot of time picking a charity that's actually implementing what you believe them to be doing, or is it rather no? You need to personally be involved and in, you know either be managing or doing some of the you know involvement in charity work. Like what's what's the kind of conclusion for what people should do? I think getting personally involved is a terrible idea. Most charities say, oh, yes, get involved. They don't want you to get involved. They want your check. The only reason they want you to get involved is so you'll take out your checkbook. If you say, I want to just hang out for five hours a week here, I mean, they have to find something for you to do. It's just, it's a mess. They want your money, and, and legitimately so. You're just getting in the, you're gumming up the works, you know, hanging out at the office. The best thing you can do is probably to just give money directly to people. I think GiveWell's top charity is called Give Directly. It just takes your money. It costs, uh, I think, 7% of the money goes to overhead, and the rest of it all just is given to people in Africa who are poor. And and it doesn't make any assumptions about, oh, this this is what you need for the money. This is how we think you should live. It just says, here's the money. Now you're no longer poor. Have a good life. It's a great idea. It's very efficient. Interesting. You know, and because one of the things I struggle with, for example, is picking a charity for me is almost like picking a mutual fund or, you know, going to a grocery store and you just have infinite selection. You're like, oh my God. I mean, there's 500 shampoos. Like, I just want a shampoo. Like, give me. <laughs> and so this is why a lot of the curation sites, you know, we've talked a lot about wire cutter on the got bought by, I think, the New York Times on this podcast where, like, and actually before we were chatting is like, I just want the best 30 inch TV. Can you just, and I don't even care if it's the best. I just don't want the bottom two quartiles, you know? <laughs> so just, can someone just please tell me the best? And it's and same thing with investments and talking about liquid all, it's same thing about charities. And so curation to me is going to be one of the biggest areas in the next 20, 30 years. And I think there's a, still a huge human element to it. We talk about it with struggling with podcasts, but my problem with charity. So for example, in you know, Puerto Rico, this huge tragedy, and of course, the also the Houston, et cetera. But then, okay, then you have this kind of paralysis is like, how can I get involved? What can I do? And it's, you know, then becomes this infinite spiral of like, how do I find the best charity or even the best 10? Is the Red Cross good? Or should I focus on, you know, because then you read some article that's like, no, no, the Red Cross has been a disaster. You know, so it, it's, it's a really hard thing that I actually personally struggle with. Well, catastrophes are extremely difficult because that's what motivates people to give is there's some catastrophe on the front page. And you say, well, I want to send money to Puerto Rico right now. But in fact, it's almost impossible to do that in any way that's helpful, whether it's a you know clothing drive at church or all these different ways. It almost never does any good to the immediate problem that you want to solve. And in fact, I know of cases where char- specific big charities will find a catastrophe. They'll fly people in. They'll, they'll fly in a team of videographers to come in and take photographs of them on the site, and then they leave immediately once they have the footage. Because they just want to show that they're there. The moral because, signaling because of it's, it. it's uh, fundraising. I was, I was thinking, like, so I was trying to put together a lot of these ideas on a personal level because I was thinking about this a while ago. And I said, all right, I want to check all the boxes for me personally and maybe experiment on doing it on a micro level. So I said, what if I dedicate X amount of money? I'm going to put $20 in an envelope. And I'm going to write on it, just like, open me or something. And then on the inside of the envelope, say, hey, um, you know, you've been given this $20 and um, go spend it on something cool, but also pass it along and maybe buy someone a cup of coffee, do something cool for someone else. And maybe it has to be more than 20 because of inflation. So to me, like, like look, that's not going to obviously change the world, but it would seem to be kind of an interesting micro gifting 
little burst of happiness idea that at least could on a daily level improve some people's lives if only for an hour or two or three and it would feel good to me to give it now the only problem is that i was like well i could never see the results of it so then i was like well maybe we should set up an anonymous instagram account this is ruining the whole idea now because it's no longer (laughs) anonymous and come up with a good hashtag And I could never come up with a good hashtag. I was like, you know, share the love, take in, spread. Something where you could actually follow people and see kind of what they did for other people. And anyway, so that was an idea that I was, I I spent a lot of time thinking about this. And I have, much like my fintech ideas, have lots of really terrible ideas. So listeners, if you have any good ideas there, shoot me an email. Because to me, that would check a lot of the boxes on giving to someone, improving their day-to-day existence, then them going to the exercise of giving to someone else and maybe creating a daisy chain of, of interesting just a little very micro happiness. Well, what it shows is how incredibly difficult it is to spend a dollar doing good. Mm. It's not easy to do. Interesting. Well, you know, and, and Jeff and I, we've talked a lot about it too with this last book we did where we told the authors they could give away, you know, their portion of writing to charity. And we only got like three of the people responded. So those three charities are going to get all of the donations because people, I, but because I think a lot of people struggle with the same same concept. Interesting. I don't know. Listeners, if you got any good ideas, let me know. All right. What else can we segue into before we totally run out of time? This might be the longest podcast yet. Let's go oh, no. like another five, 10 minutes, but, but, but the highest rated of the longest running. So Phil, let's, let's chat for a few more. So the longest, longest ever. What's been your most memorable investment? Good or bad? You can offer both. Oh my First goodness. First thing that comes to mind. First thing that comes to mind is a uh, real estate a unit investment trust that I bought uh, through my stockbroker back, this would have been in the uh, early 90s, I think. And uh, then I had to buy, a, I, then I bought a house and I needed money for the down payment. And so I said, well, you need to sell this today so I just wire it over to the bank for the down payment. And he said, oh, it's not, uh, it's not a liquid investment. You, you can't, it can't be sold. I said, well, it can be sold for some price. <laughs> And it, and it was, <laughs> but that was one of my early investment ed- educational opportunities. Give me a couple, I, I'm the world's worst at this, at this question. So caveat ahead of time. Give me a couple, um, you read any good books lately? Anything that's um, impressed you? Any ideas, concepts that uh, summertime reads? Can be fiction, can be nonfiction, can be about anything. Yeah, I'm I'm reading all the time. I seldom can even tell you the name of what I'm reading. Me I'm, ju- I'm just turning the pages, Kindle, audio books, physical books. I'm just a reading idiot. Nothing basically. stands out as like, oh well, my God, this is the best book I've read in the last year. Uh, Could I'm be a movie. Too. I'm just reading a book on uh, the relationship, uh, the, on the friendship between David Hume and Adam Smith. And it's been very interesting to me. Uh, David Hume was a philosopher. They, they were good friends, but uh, Hume was a bit older than Adam Smith. And David Hume did almost all of his important writing before he was 25 years old. He he didn't really write anything of much interest after that. But a lot of the ideas of that we find in the wealth of nations that we credit to Smith, to Adam Smith, actually derive from perhaps not not uncredited, but they were ideas that were also floated earlier by Hume. Like, for instance, the idea that the wealth of a country does not consist in the amount of gold it has in its treasury, but in the productivity of its citizens. That's a revolutionary, that's a world-changing idea. That's changed the world for the better, that, that insight. And it really, I think, goes back to David Hume. I don't know where, where Hume got it, but uh, that, was, that was news to me. So I'm, but I'm always reading lots of everything. And because I'm in financial services, when I do read about financial services, I tend to turn the pages pretty fast at this point because I've seen like I feel like I've I've seen a lot of the stuff before. I, I have a whole stack of books on my bookshelf, which is Patrick O'Shaughnessy mm-hmm. who has a podcast, but he has a book club and he sends out a couple of recommendations. So I must have thirty or forty books every time he does. I just end up buying them, but it's this massive stack. And for whatever reason, this summer. I don't know why I just like I go through cycles of just not being motivated to to read or not excited about anything. So that's why I was looking for ideas. I ended up buying like the last decades worth of the what's the science fiction? Is it it's not Booker Prize, whatever the science fiction award for best book. There's two of them, Hugo and Nebula. That's what it is. Anyway, very good. So I was trying to I was like, you know, there's got to be some good old ones. Um, I was going to try to watch the old Blade Runner this week before watching the new one. Haven't seen either yet. So 
I got I got nothing to offer though. But psychology. Any favorite behavioral psychology books? I'm not a fan of behavioral Ooh, psychology. Why not? Well, I think there's in the field of behavioral psychology, we find much that is new and much that is true. But what is true is not new, and what is new is not true. That's somebody else's quote. No. So I, I think I think that the uh, the field could really use a shakeout. I'm not sure that giving a, yet another Nobel Prize to it is going to cause that. I think it's going to more entrench the trends already apparent. I don't know if anybody that's made a dime, I could be wrong, is a behavioral hedge fund. Well, I, I, do, do they make money? I haven't Thaler, heard about Thaler it. Thaler technically, I mean, it's again, it's all in the narrative again, right? So I, I could say that Cambria is a behavioral shop and say that no, we're taking- No, it's not. Well, no, I, I, could, I could say that. Yes. I could say that it's taking advantage of others' behavioral issues. Right, and okay. Do a long PowerPoint and say our value funds are, you know. Okay. It's an argument can be made. Um, anyway, but it's all about the narrative. But but no, Thaler actually, I mean, he lends his name to, I don't know how involved he is, Fuller Thaler. Mm-hmm. I think it's a multi, I think they're over a billion, I think it's multi-billion dollar money manager. So they wrap it in that behavioral lens and they've been doing it for a long time. I don't know um, how involved he is or if it's just kind of a figurehead. Anyway, so maybe. <laughs> but mine tends to be more on the biology side. Uh, did, I, we, one of my favorite books we always talk about is Olivia Judson's Dr. Tatiana's Sex Advice to All Creation. Have you oh, yes. read that? Yes. I love it. We were trying to get her on the podcast. Jeff is failing miserably, but Olivia, if you're listening, that's one of my favorites. So more on the kind of the actual bi- evolutionary biology than... I heard about it from you, so. as a matter okay, of fact. Well, good. It was anyway. a find. It, it pays to listen to this podcast. Yeah, but it's funny because you say, I, man, I, I see that behavior in my friends and myself, that little bug or mole or cat or whatever it would be. Anyway... Listeners, if you have any particularly good books you read this summer, I, I could I could use some on my travels coming up. Uh, what do you got planned the rest of the year? Any plans? Well, I just seem to be working like a dog, trying to keep my clients happy. They've got they've got me on a short leash, so uh, I'm a I'm a hard working guy. Phil, where can people find more information about you if they want to read your writings, yeah. your every six month tweets, your blog posts? Where do they go? <laughs> I have a website, filledmuth.com. That's probably got as, as good a summation of everything as they could possibly want and more. Too much information. And you guys, seriously, go read The Overtaxed Investor, one of my favorite books, as well as Phil's other eight books. We'll have to go into the archives. And maybe that's what I'll do the rest of the years. Just go <laughs> speed read all of your other books. Put you to sleep. Phil, it's been a blast. Thanks for coming in today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Listeners, thanks for listening. Send us feedback, questions for the mailbag, feedback at the com. If you got any questions for Phil, shoot them straight his way at his website. Um, as a reminder, you can find the show notes. We're going to have a lot for this episode and other episodes at mebfaber.com forward slash podcast. Subscribe to the show on iTunes. If you're enjoying this podcast, please leave a review. For the listeners that sent us the roasted peanuts and surfing poster and handwritten note with a wax seal, I have not seen one of those in years. Thank you. From Jeff and Meb and the rest of Cambria crew, those peanuts are gone on the first week. Anyway, thanks for listening.